Psalm 19, if you'll go there with me. The book of Psalms. Psalm 19. I'm grateful to hear people praying all over the building. Isn't that a wonderful thing? All of us going to the throne of God together. Thank you for being a praying church. As we look at this book of Psalms, we've been talking about this thought of how to walk with God. The, the Psalms leads us into the heart of God. And uh, the Lord is in the work of changing lives. That's what He is doing, doing in my life and yours, I trust. And that's what He desires to do in every person on the planet, is change their life. And of course, for a life to truly be changed, it must change from the inside out. It must begin on the inside. You know, all of us are guilty of this. Many times so much attention is given to the external, uh, given to our public life. I know there's been many days where I made sure that everything that was public was in order and in line and, and uh, ordered like it ought to be, uh, to where if someone had looked at, at my, my life that had said, yep, everything's good there, no, no problems there. But I neglected to give the attention to the inner man that I ought to give. And I think we've all been guilty of that. And that's the danger, of course, we have when we just are worried about what men think. Uh, the, the fear of man brings a snare, the Bible says, but God wants to see from the heart. And if our heart will be right, we'll be right on the outside, too. If we'll have this right, he'll help us have this right with man. And so what is not seen to the human eye truly is what we are. What we really are as people is what really is not seen. Remember that iceberg I talked about last week. And, uh, and so, how's the inner man? It's interesting in where we're going to be in Matthew on Sunday. It touches this. The Lord Jesus is going to say to the Pharisees and scribes, ye hypocrites. Uh, you wash the outside of the cup, but the inside's full of extortion and excess. Well, if you're going to use a cup, who cares about the outside? I mean, it'd be nice if it was clean, but I definitely want the inside clean. But how silly we do the same thing with our lives. Sometimes we make sure everything on the outside looked good, and our neighbors would think everything was okay. But on the inside, we neglect to give attention to that. And that's what Psalm 19 is touching on. Uh, it's all about placing the emphasis on the inner man. What I truly am is what I am in my heart. And we have to remember, there's no fooling God. And if we're in this thing, and we're sincere and genuine about walking with God and being a Christian, then all that really matters is what God thinks. I'm not going to stand before a panel one day. I'm going to stand before God. Uh, he's, I'm not going to be judged by what other people thought of me. I'm going to be judged by Him in this book. And uh, if you go along very long, you realize men are fickle. And they may praise you one minute. Hosanna, son of David. And before the week's out, they crucified Jesus. And so it's not worth living for just uh, the, the opinion of man. Psalm 19, if you found your place, we're going to begin reading, and we'll read the psalm there, beginning verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day utter speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. It's an inaudible message, but it's the, loud, it's the loudest message on planet earth. Uh, it's interesting, there's no, no sound <laughs> But words and voice, look at verse 4. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun. And so as you look at the skies, you think, whoa, there must be a God. Which is as a bridegroom, the son talking about, is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices a strong man to run a race. is going forth is from the end of the heaven and the, his circuit unto the ends of it. And there is nothing hid from the heat Thereof, So he goes from the world now to the word. Verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey, and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. We learned that song last week, didn't we? Verse 12, who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. And verse 14, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. We learned that song as well. Let's try that one. You remember it? Here we go. 
Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord. Repeat. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord. My strength and my redeemer. So I want to take our title from that. Verse, uh, verse 14, the meditation of my heart. The meditation of my heart. Let's pray together. Father, help us now if you would. Lord, we know that what we need tonight is from you. And so would you open our eyes to behold wondrous things out of thy law. Oh, teach us something very practical about the word of God and how you want to impact our life on a daily basis right where we live and we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week we walked through the whole psalm pretty much, and we realized as we were looking at it that the, the, the psalmist is kind of going from the end of the planet, uh, the end of the universe, all the way down to his heart. He says, look, everything in, in creation does exactly as God told it to and is working perfectly. And I want my heart to be right with God like that. And so at the end, he prays, Lord, let the, word, uh, let the uh, uh, words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. You think about when Jesus uh, looked on creation, he said, it's good. And he got done, he said, it's very good. What does he say when he sees my heart? That's what the psalmist is saying. What does God say when he sees my heart? The plants are doing fine. The animals are great. The, the, the day and night, the sun and the tides, everything just as he said it would. But how's my heart? And so the psalm begins with the glory of the heavens and concludes with the human heart. We look at everything around us, open the psalm, and the Lord targets the heart of the matter, the meditations of our own heart. Who could know what my thoughts in my heart are? Only God. Isn't it amazing that our God is so big? He's the creator of the universe, the creator of everything, and yet he is so intimately involved in everything about you, the individual, that he knows every thought that ever courses through your mind and heart. It's pretty amazing. And that's both convicting and comforting at the same time. Every, everything he knows. And so, uh, verse 14, he says, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord. And by introduction last week, we looked at God has revealed himself in what he has wrought and what he has written and the things he's made and the word of God both. He's, he's the God of creation and of revelation. And so we looked at three things by introduction. Number one, we looked at the worlds around us. That was verses one through six. Uh, God's very creation testifies his reality. And as we see and observe, we conclude there must be a creator behind all this. If you look at the world honestly, there has to be intelligent design. There must be a creator. In verse 3, it says, there's no speech nor language or their voice is not heard. There's no need for translation. Everyone can get the message. It pours out silently, abundantly though, and universally, everybody. It's a wordless book. Everyone can read it. And God's voice of power and creation prepares the way for his voice of grace in the gospel. Number two, the word before us. So we looked at the world around us, and by introduction we looked at last week as well, the word before us. And praise the Lord that the God of creation is also a God of personal revelation to his people. The heavens declare God's glory, but the scriptures tell us what God did so that we may share in his glory. Uh, verse 9, it says, The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Uh, honestly, we cannot learn the word of God unless we show reverence and respect for the God of the word. The fear of the Lord is clean. And so the way we treat the Bible is really the way we treat the Lord. Uh, it, it isn't difficult to determine in your life if you're right with the Lord. What time are you spending his word with him? Verse 10 and 11 says, more to be desired are they than gold. Yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey. And the honeycomb. Do we desire his word? Is it more precious than wealth or, or tasty food? First Peter 2, 2 says, newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. 
Do we desire? Do we feed on God's word? Matthew 4, 4. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Will we skip a meal to spend time in the Bible? Do we attend the church dinners, but not the church Bible study? I know I'm preaching to the choir. You're here on Wednesday night, but what's with my appetite? How is my appetite? Am I hungry for Bible study? To have an appetite for God's word is a mark of a healthy Christian whose priorities are straight. I've said this to many people. Uh, you, you know, you can give a chapter and verse necessarily for Sunday school or Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Um, although the Bible talks about not forsaking the assembly of yourselves together. Basically, whenever you assemble, you're a body. You need to be all together. Be weird. A part of my body was at home. Part of my body here. But I have said this by just experience and being saved now almost 30 years. I've never known a committed Christian, a thriving Christian, a growing Christian that wasn't faithful to God's house. Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Because where else would I want to be than with God's people? Where else would I want to be when the Word of God is being taught? If I'm hungry, I go to get something to eat. Spiritually, am I hungry? Third, we looked at the witness within us. So the world around us, the Word that God's given us, and then the witness within us. God, the Redeemer, verse 14, my strength and my Redeemer. When you study God's creation with a Bible in your hand, you cannot help but see Jesus. And the word in hand, of course, is good. The word of the head is better, but the word in the heart is what transforms us and matures us. In verse 12, he says, who can understand his heirs? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. And, and so God wants to then get all the way into our heart. Verse 14, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord. So the Lord starts with a, a vast universe. We can't take it all in as you stand under the stars in the night sky. And it, it's so, so beyond us. And we looked at all the different worlds and things you see in one drop of water, all the stuff that's in that. And, and then the ocean world, all the worlds there are. And we can't take it all in, but we know a great God made it. And then he works his way home to our hearts. He touches our lips, the words of our mouth, but then he gets to the heart. If our heart is right... Our lips will be right. Uh, you, can, you can fix everything on the exterior, but if you don't take care of the heart, nothing will be changed. And until we allow God to change our heart, we're never going to be changed. It's like some people, and some of you I know have done these uh, house flip, you know, buy a house and it's run down. You put new paint, new this, that. Well, if you go into the house and begin to realize there's foundation trouble, but you don't address that and you put new paint on the walls and on the outside and you you fix the roof and you take care of uh, all the different things that might need to be done uh, on the exterior, the new flooring or whatever like that. And suddenly the whole thing collapses. Anyone that knows anything about building would say, well, I know why you didn't deal with the foundation. And so the Lord says, if you want to be right with me, there's only one place to begin. The meditation of the heart. Everything comes from that fountain. The Bible talks about keep thy heart without all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Everything comes from there. Be right with God is a heart matter. Jeremiah 17, 9 said, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doing that's Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10. Hey, we need to ask God for heart help. Lord, I need help in my heart. How about you? Matthew 12, 33, 34, and 35 says, Either make the tree good, it's fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt, it's fruit corrupt. For the tree is known by its fruit. Oh, generation of vipers, how can you be an evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. The good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man of the evil treasure of the heart bringeth forth evil things. Look, your mouth is telling on your heart. Our mouth tells. See, your heart is telling your mouth what to say. And so when something comes out and someone says, oh, I don't know why I said that. The Bible says, he knows why you said it. It's in your heart, see. You say, there's a mean husband, he's mistreating his wife and verbally abusing her and saying ugly things. And you say, uh, this man needs to change. You say, yeah, he needs to start saying kind words and he, he needs to uh, fix up what he's saying. No, that's not what he needs. What he needs is a heart change. See, this is what we all need. It starts with our heart. Verse 14, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart 
be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord. So when God sees the meditation of my heart, can I ask you, would you ask him, is it acceptable to him? When he sees the meditation of your heart, is it acceptable to him? Remember how important the heart is to God. Israel wanted a king, and they have Saul, and Saul will not do right, and so God rejects him as king. In Acts 13, the New Testament gives a little information about this. Acts 13, 22 says, And when he had removed him, Saul, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. He looked for someone with the right heart towards God and knew that he would do the right thing. See, many times we try to start doing the right thing, but we haven't dealt with our heart. God looked for someone that had the right heart. He says, he's a man after my own heart, and I know what he'll do then. He'll fulfill all my will. Why? Because his heart's right. And so he said, I want to do right. I want to be the right type of Christian. I want to stand before God and hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. The only way it'll happen is if I'll get my heart right. He said, I've got to do something. I've got to go as a missionary. And if God calls you, you ought to go and do whatever. But that's not how you're going to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. The way you'll hear it is by getting your heart right. When you get your heart right, then you'll fulfill God's will. So that's what we must look at. Again, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Our job is just to follow him. God will make us what he wants us to be. So I believe the meditation of our heart is acceptable to God when our heart seeks the things that God seeks. And our heart's desire is God's desire for us. And so we considered the interpretation of the psalm really last week, and, and we concluded last time with this question. This was the, the only conclusion you could come to after this psalm, and what we looked at is the decision we should make. I must, I'm going to spend more time in this book. And, and some of you raised your hands saying, that was your decision. Many did. And you said, God spoke to me about spending more time in this book. And so give yourself a little self-checkup. How'd you do this past week? Have you spent more time in this book? That's between you and the Lord. How have you done? How have we done? Now we'll consider the application. And oh, it's a great application. It's simple. Just three words. I'm going to encourage you to write them in the margin of your Bible if you'd like. But if our heart meditation is going to be acceptable to God, there are certain things that are necessary. How can I get my heart that way, that my heart meditation should be acceptable in His sight? So three things it takes. I'm going to have... To have my meditation of my heart right. Remember the heart of the psalmist. Oh Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord. I see your world and all it is. I want my heart to be like that. I want my life to be right. How do I get it that way? Well, three key words that this message hinges on. I want to encourage you to write them down. First of all, the first word is time. It's going to take time. You know, we all have the same problem. I, I don't have time to get my meditation, my heart right, acceptable to God. I've got more important things to do. Really? It's funny, isn't it? You say, I would never say that publicly. I don't have to say it, though, because if my, I'm not getting my heart right, my life says it for me. People can see it. Same is true for you. If I'm not spending time in God's word, it shows up in my life. It's especially obvious in my wrong reactions to circumstances. Now notice with me verses 7, 8, 9. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. There's six different names of God's word here and six attributes of the word and six ministries of the word in the lives of those that receive it and obey it. Look at it. The law of the Lord is perfect. What does it do? Converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure. What does it do? Making wise the simple. Statue of the Lord are right. Rejoice in the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure. Enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean. Enduring forever. The judgment of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. You say, I want that in my life. These six things the word of God does. But here's the reality. It does not do that in my life. Unless I give time to it. Look, you don't get the word of God by having it on your coffee table. You don't get the word of God just by downloading some app on your computer or on your phone. You don't get the word of God in you by dusting it off and bringing it to church on Sunday morning. You don't get the word of God by any other means, but personally, daily spending time 
in it. It's going to require a real investment of time. Time. If my meditation in my heart is going to be acceptable to God, I must have time with God. How many of us have been convicted about this? And maybe you came to the altar and said, oh, God, I'm going to get, spend time in your word. And you did. And you began to see the fruits of it. And this is what you thought. Lord, oh, why didn't I realize this sooner? This time is such well-spent time to take the time to be right with you before I head out in the day. It's the one thing needful to spend time with the Lord. No time with God's ever wasted. So if the meditation of our heart's going to be acceptable to God, it's going to take time. That's powerful to me. Time. The second word grows out of that. It's the word truth. Truth. Remember Jesus praying in John 17. He was praying to his father. He was praying about the disciples, concerning the disciples. In John 17, 17, he said, sanctify them through thy what? Truth. Thy word is truth. Thy word is truth. In other words, if you want to be clean, if we want to be sanctified, if we want to be right with God, God's truth has to enter inside of us. God's truth is like a huge floodlight. It turns on the light on the inside, on everything that's dark inside of us, on every sin in my life. It uncovers everything. People can be so blinded in our world with the philosophical and, and the ideological things of, of life. It's unbelievable to hear people talk about uh, uh, the religion. Uh, I've talked to someone just recently, and, oh, I love to talk about stuff like that. In fact, I thought you guys were Jehovah's Witness, and I love to talk to them. And, and I don't go to any church, but I, I just love to talk about it. Well, we have our own views, and, and they like to hypothesize just with all this gobbly goop. But they don't know what the truth is. They just like to argue and talk about it. And not even necessarily argue, just exchange ideas. Like them in Athens that like to hear something new. And they like to be philosophical about it and, and express what they think. There's no truth. It's like hy hypothesizing in a philosophical maze. They're just wandering. It's absolute blindness. It's blindness. See, the truth turns on the light. The truth turns on the light. Notice the progression of this psalm. Verse 7, 8, and 9 is all about the word of God, the law of the Lord, the statute of the Lord, the testimony of the Lord, the commandments of the Lord, the fear of the Lord, the judgments of the Lord. We looked at it last week. The word of God, the word of God. Verse 10, more to be desired are they than gold. What he's talking about? The word of God. Verse 11, again, the word of God. And then verse 12, who can understand his error? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. In other words, I don't even know my own sin unless God reveals it to me. How is he going to reveal it? When is he going to reveal it? He does it when the truth enters the heart of men and that turns the light on. So I can see. Then it reveals the darkness. That, that's what keeps us from the presumptuous sin of verse 13 and the great transgression of verse 13. The word of God keeps us from that because it comes in with a big floodlight and shows what's wrong while it's secret faults before it becomes the presumptuous sin and becomes the great transgression. See, nobody ever intends to get the great transgression, verse 13. David had some experience about that. Oh, what a cost it cost him. Four of his boys, his daughter raped by her brother. Nobody ever intends to get there, but we get there by neglecting the word of God. Like I said last week, sometimes we think someone falls, some Christian falls, some pastor falls, and it's just all of a sudden, bam, and you're like, whoa, I never saw that coming. But the truth is that's not how it happened. It began by them neglecting the word of God, and no one knew about it. And in time, the secret sins became presumptuous sins, and they began what they should have forsaken, they excused instead of forsaking it. Before long, the great transgression hit. Oh, we must stay in the word of God. We need the truth of the word of God. That's why the psalmist in Psalm 119, 11 said, Thy word have I hid in my heart. Why? Why have you hid it in your heart? That I might not sin against thee. 
See, if you don't get God's Word inside your heart, you're going to sin. Why? Because you don't even recognize your own sin. We excuse our sin and we gloss over our sin. Oh, we can notice everyone else's problem, but we don't see ours unless we get the Word of God, the truth. It's going to take time spent in the truth. Can I ask you, how many verses have we memorized in 2021? How many verses have you memorized in the last six months? See, God's Word must be read. It must be studied. It must be meditated on. It must be memorized. We must give our time to God's truth. If the meditation of our heart is going to be acceptable to God, it's going to take time. And it's going to take truth. Thirdly, lastly, third word is thought. Thought. And these are all connected Of course, this is why it's essential to take the time to put God's truth in your heart every day because the real battleground in life is in the mind. It's in our thoughts. That's the seat of our heart, the thoughts that course through our mind. Uh, Turn please over to 2 Corinthians. We're going to come back. We're going to mark there in Psalm. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10. You probably know this verse. If not, you ought to memorize it. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 4 and 5. The Bible says, therefore, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. You say, you don't understand the problem I have. Look at verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. I've got problem with, with lying. I've got problem with lusting. I've got problem with stealing. I've got problems with, you name it, coveting. How do I get rid of it? Well, you don't take a knife out or get a gun out. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. But get this, they are mighty. Through God to the pulling down of strongholds. You can kick the devil out. You can get rid of it. How? Verse 5, casting down imaginations. In every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity, circle this in your Bible, every thought to the obedience of Christ. Every thought. I thought, how do, how do I cast down? How can I cast down thoughts and imaginations? Only God is great enough to do that. So that means on a daily basis, I have to stop. I must stop. Every time a thought comes through my mind that should not be there, that does not honor Christ, I must stop that moment and say, Lord, I give you that thought. It's not an obedience to you. See, the devil came to Eve and put a thought in her mind. God's not being good to you. He knows if you have that fruit, you'll be like God's. God's withholding from you. And she should have taken that thought and cast down that imagination and said, that's not right. That's not in obedience to Christ. It's not true. But she allowed that thought. That's what her mistake was that led to the great transgression. See, there's only one mightier than your thoughts, and that's God. You cannot do this on your own power. How then do you do it? You use the word of God, and you yield every thought to God. You're in 2 Corinthians. Turn over to Philippians. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. The Bible says that this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Well, Christ went to Calvary. What do we have to complain about? Christ went to Calvary. You know, so often we're not thinking right. You have problems with your car, and so you get aggravated. But what we don't think about is the person doesn't have a car. See, we don't think right. If someone gets aggravated with his children, oh, these kids are driving me crazy. But what about the parents whose children died in children's hospital, died as infants, can't have children. Some may get aggravated with their dad or mom or what about the orphan who never grew up knowing their children, their their dad and mom? See, we're not thinking properly. Wouldn't it be wonderful if the mind of Christ was in us? Can I tell you, if that was the case, I can assure you this, the meditation of your heart would be acceptable in his sight. You're in Philippians. Go over to Philippians 4, verse 8. God gives a list of things that ought to characterize our thoughts. Verse 8, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest. He's already talking about thoughts with verse 5, saying the Lord's at hand. Remember, he's right there. Verse 6, don't don't be worrying, but rather pray. Don't worry about that thought. You'll have the peace of God if you'll do this. Then verse 8, he gives a list. Now, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure. Uh, Can I ask you? What you've been thinking on today, was it true? Was it pure? See, we've got to take the test. Do our thoughts line up? 
What sort of things are lovely? What sort of things are good report? If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, what? Think on these things. So if they don't meet the test, don't think on them. Cast down that thought. Lord, I'm giving you that thought. It's not true. Or I don't know if it's true, so I'm going to give it to you. I'm not going to let the devil put that in. It may or may not be true, but I don't know it's true. I'm putting it down. I'm giving it to you. I'm casting that care upon you. See, the things I'm thinking about this day, are they true and honest and all of this? Colossians, go over one more book. Colossians 2.8, while we're, while we're at it. Look at verse 8. Beware lest any man spoil you. you think of my cottage cheese? How do I spoil? It's the word spoiling like robbing. Okay? Beware lest any man spoil you. How are they robbing you? Through philosophy. And vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. How have they robbed these people in Colossae? These, this, at the church of Colossae that he's warning against, how are they robbing them? By thinking wrong. You understand the world can rob you. The spoils of war, that's what he's talking about, robbing, just by getting us to think the wrong way. By just getting us to think on the wrong things. The world tells you, you deserve a break today, you know. Well, I don't deserve that. I deserve hell today. But you deserve a new iPhone. You deserve. See, the world can have a robbing effect on us just by getting us to think wrong. See, I'm a pauper spiritually when my thought life is bankrupt. And you are a pauper. You're a poor man spiritually. You're starving spiritually when your thought life is bankrupt. Colossians 3, 2. <clears throat> Set your affections. What should I think of? Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. How could I do that? Verse three, chapter 3, verse 1. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things are above, where Christ is on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Jesus is coming back. Jesus died for you. Your, your life is in him. Lord, let the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. You remember Psalm 73? A psalmist in Psalm 73 is about to slip. He's about to fall because he gets envious at the wicked. Everything seems to be going good for him. Uh, his, his spouse is the most beautiful person you ever saw. Uh, the, the house he has is better. His car is brand new. He's, he just got a promotion. Everything's going great for them. Why am I having all this trouble? What's the point of being a Christian? And he was thinking wrong. He was being robbed by his wrong thinking. What happened? Do you remember? He went to the house of God. And when he went in the house of God, he started thinking right. And it finally dawned on him. I'm not going to hell. That man is going to hell without God and without hope. High heavens, my home. And he began to think right. Psalm 73, 17 says, Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I therein. See, the words we speak begin with the thoughts in our heart. So the bottom line on this message is this. The bottom line is your, is your thought life will never be what it ought to be until you take time every day to put God's truth in your heart and mind. Your thought life will never be what it ought to be until you take time every day to put God's truth in your heart and mind. My life as a Christian is always connected to the Lord. Always. Somebody says, how am I going to get the strength to think the right thoughts? You don't understand the things I battle and how am I going to get the strength to say the right things? The Lord is our strength. You see that at the end? Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. He's redeemed us. Imagine if we had redeemed thoughts. He's redeemed us. And all of us, all of that only happens, see, as we take the time to put God's truth in our heart. As we conclude... Three things about this book. The book has the power to convict us. Verse 11, Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. We find warning in the Word. This book warns us. The Word of God has an uncanny way of confronting us with our sin. I have no idea what you may be facing, but isn't it amazing how you'll open your Bible and read your devotion time tomorrow, and God will put his finger right on it. Or you'll come into some place and hear a preacher. You turn on the radio preacher. The person of you know you're listening. And God will put his hand right on. How does that happen? That's so spooky. How does that? Now that's the Holy Spirit of God. See, 
This book has the power to convict us. So if you allow this book and spend time in this book every day, you will not get far from God because we find warning in his word. Verse 11, moreover by them, talking about the word of God, is thy servants warned. And in keeping of them, there's great word. The word of God confronts us. It's like a surgeon's knife. It's able to cut through all the outside, all, all the surface things, all the facade we want to put up. It cuts right through that and reveals the cancer of the soul. The real problem in my life and in your life. It's like Billy Sunday said, this book will keep you from sin or sin will keep you from this book. This book has the power to convict. This book also has the power to cleanse. Verse 12, who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. See, radical cleansing comes from sin or radical cleansing from sin Depends on the blood of Calvary, all that salvation. If you don't know the Lord as your Savior tonight, the great sacrifice was paid. This was pictured in the temple and in the tabernacle by the, alt, the brazen altar. On there was the, went the sacrificial lamb, and on that was the radical cleansing needed. That once for all salvation, the Lord Jesus provided that. When I got saved, I had the radical cleansing made new. Peter would say, wash me all over then, Jesus. When he finally gave in, Jesus said, no, you're already washed. You don't need that. But your hands and and your feet and your face needs to be clean. And that's the recurring cleansing that I need. See, this book has the power to cleanse. First, salvation, the first work of the Word of God we looked at last week, brings us to the day of salvation, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. But recurrent cleansing from sin depends on the Word of God. Literally pouring the Word of God into our life. The washing of water. By the word. There was the brazen altar, but then there was also the laver, the brazen laver. And after the sacrifice, even coming between the altar and and the temple, walking across the courtyard, their feet would get dirty, their hands dirty, and they would come to the laver. And you know what the laver was made of? It was made of mirrors. And the laver both revealed defilement, and there was water in it, and it removed the defilement. You know what the word of God does? It reveals the defilement in your life and mine. And also it's the washing of the water by the Lord. It removes the defilement. It'll wash it out. Ephesians 5, 26 says that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. He's talking about the bride of Christ, you and me. We need to spend time daily reading God's word so that it's convicting and it's cleansing work might act upon our souls. You remember Zacchaeus? What happened to old Zacchaeus? <clears throat> Kids today were just singing about Zacchaeus uh, climbing that tree. Remember that little short guy? He couldn't see, so he had to climb a tree where Jesus was going to pass by so he could see the Jesus. Well, you know what Zacchaeus was? He was a tax collector. He was a publican. He sided with Rome against his own people. The Jews hated him. Zacchaeus gets saved. Jesus said, I'm going to your house today, remember? Well, at his house, he gets saved, and he stands up and says, The half of my goods I give to the poor. If I've taken wrong from any, wrongfully from anyone, I'm going to repay fourfold, 400%. Now listen, you don't become a tax collector just because there's nothing else to do. You became a tax collector because you loved money. You're greedy. Everyone hated you. Your own family disowned you. It'd only be one reason you'd do it. You wanted the money. What happened to this man? Half of your money you're going to give away? That You gave up your whole life for the money. You're going to give it away? What happened? See, he was a covetous sinner. The Caesar didn't care how much tax you took. He just said, you give me this amount, and as long as I have that amount, whatever extra you charge the people, that's yours. I don't care. He didn't care about the people. He didn't care how much they were cheating. So Zacchaeus, he got rich through cheating people on their taxes. But he meets Christ. (laughs) He's changed. He stood up, Luke 19, 8. Said, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give the poor. If I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. So the man Zacchaeus, who once craved gold, now craves God. Now think about this. More to be desired are they than gold, back in Psalm 19, verse 10. Yea, than much fine gold. See, that's the power of the Word of God to cleanse. In this case, he was looking in the face of the living Word, the Lord Jesus Christ. This book, as lastly, has the power to correct us, verse 13, 14. Keep back thy servant also presumptuous sin. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Then that prayer, that heart cry, then let the words of my mouth, meditation of my heart, be accepted in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Is the power to correct us. 
lady once asked a ship captain, do you know where all the rocks are and the, the shallow places in the whole sea there in the ocean? <laughs> captain looked back to her and said, oh, no. He lifted up his chart and said, no, no. I don't know where all the rocks are, but I know where the deep waters are. And I know where to sail. You see, God's word is a chart that steers us clear of the rocks. You don't have to know. You don't have to be wise to all the worldly things and the wicked things. But if we'll be wise to the word of God, we can stay simple to all the rocks. I know where the right paths are. I know what the yeses are. Yes, Lord. And uh, he'll help me take care of all the no's. I'll walk with him every day and yielded to him, saying yes to him. And God will help me know what to say no to as I'm yielded to him. Oh, what a prayer. God's word has power to correct us. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be accepted in thy sight, O oh Lord. This, such, such a prayer like this must bring joy to the heart of God. May we, may we all pray that tonight. Lord, that's what I want for me. Let's bow in prayer, would you?